Good afternoon. This is the June 21st meeting of the Ordinance Committee. Uh, I want to wish everyone a happy first day of summer. Uh, today, um, well, first let's do call to order. I'm so used to not doing Robert's rules that... Tody, do you oh. mind? Do, do you go by chairs? Whatever. Chair Caterminas? I'm here. Councilor Dunning? Present. And Will will be late when we will get... Assistant Town Manager. Thank you. Um, approval of minutes. I have not seen any written minutes for the 19th of okay. April. So we could get those and we'll approve them the next meeting. Yes. Item four is discussion on adult use of recreational marijuana. And uh, the reason that this is before us is the state has finally put together some rules, promulgated rules on marijuana and what towns can and cannot do. And what we'd like to do is at least begin a discussion. Um, I have met with uh, Assistant Manager Crockett on this, and I'm going to defer to her. Do you want to introduce sure. what we're up to with this, please? Yeah, so there's a couple of reasons why I wanted to get this on the agenda as soon as possible. One of them is that um, we, were, we talked a few months ago about wanting to wait for the state not only to craft this legislation that's finally passed, but also we were assured that the state was going to take up some language in their medical marijuana statutes that would allow for municipalities to do some sort of zoning regulation of medical marijuana facilities. And that has not happened within the, the adult, is now being called adult use rather than recreational, so adult use marijuana. Um, and there are two bills that we still have faint hope that the legislature might take up in their special session, um, but that hope is fading fast. But those two bills both have a sentence in them that would allow for a municipality to use land use zoning to regulate where, where medical marijuana um, can take place. And so outside of people's homes, like, but with a good commercial sort of way. And why that's important and why we were hoping that that was going to come forward is that um, we've received a couple of phone calls that are exploring kind of where Scarborough is on this. And from one of the things that is in your packet that I would like us to discuss at some point is the zoning language. I gave you in your packet um, section 21 industrial district out of the zoning ordinance 405. So I think it's, it was probably your, yeah. I don't know which page, it's in item four. It will look like zoning. Yeah, I'm yeah it's three from the back. Keep going. That's the article. <laughs> that's still the article. And it is, that's, there we go. Right so in that, you'll see that it lists under permitted uses within the industrial district. Number 13 says retail sales or services if such sales or services are accessory to principal permitted uses. And so what that means is that if you are a fully um, permitted, good to go business in the industrial zone, our zoning provides for you to have a small retail component where you can sell products that are directly connected to whatever your core business purpose is. In our industrial zone, we have marijuana cultivation taking place under the medical marijuana um, provisions. And our zoning, because the town is not allowed to in any way um, restrict medical marijuana production, the state has preempted that. They've said, hands off, it's all us. We, our zoning then says to those medical marijuana cultivators that they would be allowed to have a small retail front shop in front of, as part of their cultivation activities. And we've had a couple of calls about that. So I wanted to bring that to your attention for discussion so that it was clear why that was happening, that it was not that the town had um, dropped the ball or that the town hadn't been aware that this was happening. But really the choice is either we amend the zoning to prohibit all industrial uses from having that authority, or we leave our zoning as it stands and understand that that means that a, mar a medical marijuana cultivator may choose to open a retail establishment in there that would only be allowed to sell to medical marijuana cardholders. But because of the fifth rotating client provision, that really, so a medical marijuana caregiver may have four kind of set mm -hmm. clients, mm -hmm. and then they have a fifth client that can change immediately. So if you, if you have a storefront that opens from a medical marijuana provider, it really is a retail shop for anyone that is carrying a medical marijuana mm -hmm. card. 
And so we just wanted to bring that to your attention and let you know that that was, that was possibly happening and that you do have an option. The option is, if that is not of interest to the town council, we can prohibit retail sales at all in the industrial zone. Mm -hmm. Or if council does not wish to impact other industry, then we just need to understand that that is a possibility. Uh, so it's an all or none? I would interpret that as an all or none until such time as the state legislature um, enacts language that gives municipalities land use regulation authority. As soon as right. those sentences are enacted, then we would have the authority to, within this, say, on Section 13, um, exempting medical marijuana and adult use marijuana facilities. And that would take care of if, if council didn't want to have right. retail shops. Hey, well. No, it wasn't. Traffic's not your fault. What? <laughs> I apologize for not having anticipated. That's that okay. Uh, is, uh, do we know if medical marijuana uh, growers, we're talking about people yep. who are growing, uh, can have this small retail ancillary use, is that occurring at the present time? Not that we are aware of, but like I said, we've had inquiries both to me and to the planning department. So we think that it's possible that people are exploring that option and looking to expand their business in that way. And the uh, significant restriction is it's not recreational, it's not open to the public. You have to have a medical card that says you're, because it's probably by prescription, so physician prescription. I think my understanding is in order to receive one of those cards, you would need to get from a doctor you know, there's a process that the state has provided for people that are seeking medical marijuana access. Um, and I think that it's also important to point out, and I've pulled up zoning maps for a different reason, so they're highlighting a different area, but we can think of where our industrial zones are, okay? So on this, we can see this purple color is industrial. Um, that's light industrial over there. Um, and then there's a bunch of industrial down here. Sorry, I really later want to talk about B2 and B3. Um, and there are no schools in those areas, so we don't have, you know, we, there, we don't see it as a, a problem necessarily, but we do want the public to be aware of it, and we want you guys to be aware of it, and know that you do have an option. If, if you feel that the, the community of Scarborough would not want to have storefront medical marijuana being sold, then we can change that, but only by removing any industrial activities mm -hmm. right to have a storefront. Um. I wasn't sure also, and this just came into my mind now, I didn't think of it prior, is the, these businesses that are currently doing the medical marijuana under this new state law, can they switch to being cultivators of recreational or? So that leads us into our second part of the marijuana conversation. Okay. So only if the town of Scarborough chooses Allows to opt us. in. Okay. So the state law is very clear. There are now only four categories of adult use marijuana cultivation, manufacture of ma marijuana products, testing of marijuana products, and retail sales of marijuana products. They have removed social clubs from being an option. So the four that are remaining, all four of those uses must opt in. If the town of Scarborough chose to opt into cultivation of recreational marijuana or adult use marijuana is what the law is, it calls it, um, there is statutory language that prohibits the cultivation from taking place within the same planting area. They must be separated. They can be owned by the same people, and they can be adjacent, but they must be clearly defined. Can I ask a couple questions before we jump? So, uh, and when we refer to cultivation, that's not, so there's a, there's a part of the law that will allow an adult to have up to three plants, I saw, and that, that's not. We're not talking about talking that. about so, restricting that at all. Scarborough does not have to opt in. That's state law. And we are actually prohibited from anything other than allowing that. So the state law is very clear. A municipality may not in any way limit a residential home from having per adult that's 21 years of age or older, three mature plants, 12 um, immature plants, and unlimited seedlings. So, and those can be shared to other people that are 21 years or older, okay, free of charge. You may not sell them, okay? Um, but we have no authority to in any way deal with that. We're, so we're really only talking about, when we talk about cultivation, we're talking about commercial level cultivation. Gotcha. So when it said transfer in, in, the, in the statute that was in the material, that referred to transfer for free. You can't, yeah. you cannot you sell can. it rub it. And can, can we just back up, because I walked in late and I apologize again. But when we were referring to in the industrial park and the storefront, that was specifically to medical marijuana 
right. because the law had has now changed that they, we have to allow the storefront, or that has always been the it's case? It's always been the case. So the, well, our zoning allows for the storefront. And because our zoning allows for any business within our industrial zone to have the languages retail sales or services if such sales or services are accessory to principal permitted uses. If you are a medical marijuana cultivator within our industrial zone, this zoning applies to you. And the state has made it very clear that we do not have the option to in any way address medical marijuana in our zoning. So we can't say except for medical marijuana facilities. Could we do the opposite? Could we say uh, only these types of use? You'll, I don't understand. Well, so if we said, um, if we said you may have a storefront if you are a, a distributor, wholesaler. Um, of this, that, and the other. The, yeah, of, of such, such and such, and then not include where we would not. I think that that would be challengeable in court, and I would not advise that. It's an idea, though. I, I, you know, my reaction to this is uh, keeping out of the way of medical marijuana at mm. the town level at the present time makes sense because I do think that almost anything we do would subject ourselves to the risk of uh, an action uh, uh, by medical marijuana growers and providers. Uh, when I think about the industrial zone, I'm, I mean, I've seen this kind of retail operation. If you park at local 188 uh, and go and have brunch there, the backmost door, mm -hmm. there's people coming in and out of there, and I'm told that's a distributor of medical marijuana. It has, has virtually no visibility, and I expect none of these facilities in the industrial zone have any visibility. And, and that, that's where you need the, the card, yes. correct? Yeah. And presumably, if you have such card, you need, this is your medicine, and right. that's why this is mm -hmm. a medical, right. doctors prescribe mm -hmm. this for you. So right. we, we wouldn't want to necessarily hinder the ability for someone who needs this to be able to have to drive out of town to get it. Because if you have a right to grow it and distribute it to medical patients, patients for medical purposes. How do you do that unless you have uh, the ability to have a retail transaction take place? So I would think that unless we identified a actual issue, problem, mm -hmm. we would kind of stay out of the way of that for the time being and wait till we learned more. That makes sense. And, and I would agree with that. I mean, I'm not interested in getting involved in interfering at all with medical marijuana. Um, and, and when uh, Larissa and I talked prior to this meeting, um, I, I was interested in hearing that it's this uh, Section 13 under uh, Section 21 um, is the retail sales of services is, is either all or none. You know, so if we said, oh, no, we don't want this happening, and then you're going to say, we don't want it happening for anybody, whether it's chocolate bars or no, clam I mean, cakes or... I mean, whatever. Larissa's right. The, uh, the judicial review always looks at the legislative history. Mm -hmm. Why'd you do something? Mm -hmm. right. What was the discussion? And so... So it, I already, I already yeah, messed it up. So we'll do that right up. <laughs> I mean, that's... That's, uh, yeah. that's a good yeah. question, though. Well, but it is... Uh, and it would be outside of the intent of the law. Like, it, yeah. it would be poor form on our part. Yeah. Uh, the uh, the opt-in piece, the, the yeah. recreational piece, uh, I have always thought that the non-retail parts of that uh, uh, grow and test seem to be quite appropriate for opt-in. Uh, I have always thought, given, I think, the attitude of Scarborough people, that we ought to go slow on retail, opt-in. We, we now have to actually mm -hmm. actively pursue it. I thought the idea of a survey mm -hmm. yeah. was, a, was a good idea to test the temperature of the community. So uh, that would be kind of where I, where I am. I don't mm -hmm. know where you guys So per person, I'd like to see the, the if we're going to do a survey, let's do it for each use. If we have, if, I assume we can opt in separately, is yes. my understanding, for each one. And, and I, must. I, must. And yeah. then, then I would say, let's, let's, if we're going to be asking people, let's ask them. Yeah. And let Larissa kind of oh. organize and run that. Yeah. And I, I would agree with that. My number one on my notes coming in, again, was survey, get a feel for what the town will support. 
Um, and I, we have time and opportunities this summer, I think, to, to do that. Um, I do uh, think that the testing and manufacturing portions of this could be something that we do are interested in as a town, but again, you know, get the sense of the people. Because I think when people see, oh, this marijuana, it's like, oh, everyone's going to run around smoking, getting stoned, and whatever. And there are other aspects of marijuana use that, particularly medical, that I think are, in my own opinion, are, are legitimate. And I think there is an industry to be had there. And why wouldn't Scarborough want to get involved in it, for sure? So staff, I met with both our planning director and our um, economic development director about this and, and just kind of checking to see what 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 zones would things go in, what sort of areas would do we think that the town is best suited for. And our economic development director, um, who is always of course very pro-business, and mm -hmm. but yeah. her point was that she, of all of them, she would be um, most not just kind of cautious about opening up further industrial space to cultivation. Her thoughts were that we have such limited industrial space that to, it's a, it, her words were, it is not the highest and best use of the limited space that we have. Mm -hmm. So I think that um, that was one of her thoughts was that we would just want to be aware that the manufacturing aspect, the testing aspect, absolutely, full steam ahead, those are, um, and from a, because the state law is now written, there is nothing coming back to the towns. So yeah. prior versions of this law allowed for, for instance, for testing facilities, there was going to be an excise tax attached per unit of measure, weight measure, that would come back to the towns from each of those sales. Well, the state has now said, actually, we're going to take all of it, and 12% of what we take in is going to go into a public health campaign about marijuana. But the rest of it, the other 88%, is it's just going to go into the general coffers. Um, so there isn't the same level of, of economic benefit to our community that there would have been prior. And with cultivation, there's a very, there's not a lot of taxable property to, that comes with that industry. Whereas for something like the manufacture of, of marijuana products or, or with testing, we'd expect that to be a, a better tax base enhancement, as well as from a job standpoint. Um, we did quite a bit of research a few months ago on the testing facilities, and those are really high paying biotech jobs. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of a, a hub that we are interested in, in supporting. I wonder if in the surveys there'd be a way to include or reference some of that, because it might it might influence how people because they might think oh cultivation well why not but there's a fairly good argument for yeah, why I, why that's not a value because I think the, the cultivation that is taking place presently is is greenhouse style cultivation mm -hmm. it's not in the open air no but it's interior yeah. it's interior I so, believe for the so most part so it's, I mean house grows it's might either, be outside so it's either greenhouse or it's grow lights uh, uh, in, a, uh, in just an enclosed structure. But it has to be heated, obviously. Uh, yeah. So those, and, and the odor issue, which we've been warned about uh, before by neighborhood residents, is a concern. And so if you're dealing with an activity, I mean, it'd be like saying to Westbrook, 30, 40 years ago, do you really want this odor in your community? And so, I mean, I don't think we, I'd be, I'd be concerned about that. Uh, and I'm not sure the rural farming district would be that enthused about it. Maybe, I don't know. Um, since you bring up rural farming, I'm sorry. Uh, I was just, just going to ask uh, uh, Bill if you could clarify a little bit. But what, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just missing the... the um, the point that you're making around, like, should we, should we, are you saying they, don't, don't include it in the survey at all? Well, no, I, I, I think that there's, there, there's a real odor issue oh, sure. uh, associated with it. And so I think, and the state law does not uh, give us any guidance on, on that. So uh, I think that's something that we need to control. And I think that uh, uh, if you're not going to make any real money in the industrial zone, and we, we really have no additional space in the industrial zone to, to do it. Uh, and you're really not going to put it in a residential zone, uh, then you're, you're kind of reaching that point of why you're doing it. 
I have a question. Um, when I was on the council before, and then I was off here, and I'm not quite sure what happened or not, there was some discussion about marijuana cultivation, medical marijuana cultivation in the RF zone, and... I'm not aware that we have that happening, what, uh, so I, I can look into Other that for you. Other than personal Right, personal use, marijuana. but um, I, when, when I met with Jay, kind of talking to him about which zones would we be looking yeah. at, so for cultivation, testing, and manufacture of adult use, um, industrial. industrial crossroads, is also would be yeah. that would be allowed without any change to zoning light industrial the Haggis Parkway and the Pine Point Industrial Overlay District. So all of those are districts that the current zoning would allow for those those three uses, without needing to change zoning. Mm -hmm. um, I also did make reach out to Old Orchard Beach, Saco, and Gorham to see where they were mm -hmm. with this because I thought that it might help inform our discussion about well if if Old Orchard Beach is going to have recreational retail shops right up to the Pine Point border, that changes our conversation possibly a little bit. So Older Beach has actually um, made it very clear that they will not be opting into any form of mm -hmm. recreational adult use marijuana. Um, and Saco in September, prior to the law being passed, actually wrote and passed ordinance that allows for every form of medical, um, of, of mm -hmm. recreational marijuana um, in industry. So that would, we can imagine in the areas that um, Saco has available for s different things. So our coming up against Dunstan, you've got right. that Route 1 corridor that we can right. imagine there being maybe retail activity taking place there. And then Saco still does have space in their industrial park. And so and with its easy access to 95, we could see them being attractive opportunity for testing or manufacturer facilities. Mm -hmm. um, and then Gorham has not made any decisions yet. They have that on their agenda coming this fall. They're planning on, on picking up that discussion. Uh, South Portland and Portland have uh, announced at the Metro Regional Coalition meetings that they're both all in. Oh, okay. And that's just because their constituency wants them to be. Right. And so, so we'll be Saco on the one side, South Portland and Portland on the other side, huh. where the uh, retail sale, as well as growing. So. Um, the only. Is when we had spoke when we started this conversation a few months ago, um, there will be very limited need for testing facilities. And so when we thought we could get excise revenue mm. from a testing facility, it's really only expected to need one or two testing facilities for the state of Maine. Mm. Um, and so Scarborough is well located <coughs> for that. And so when there was a chance of increasing revenue through attracting this business that has no odor issues, no health hazards, right. no, ch um, it, there was some interest in in making that decision sooner rather than later to signal to the industry that if we were going to opt into that, that we would like them to consider our Haggis Parkway district certainly as a, as a great place for that activity to take place. Um, where there is no longer any revenue incentive, the, <laughs> the, uh, I think it's still a nice, it's a possibly a nice addition to our biotech sort of hub that we have, but there is a lot less incentive to act as quickly as possible mm -hmm. on that. Um, are there any members of the public who would like to comment on this? If so, please approach the podium, let us know who you are and where you live, and I'll give you a couple minutes to talk about. Henry, <coughs> Henry Pelletier, 10th Snow Canning Road, Scarborough, Maine. <coughs> we own the old uh, Snows building, mm -hmm. and we've got the... Uh, 12 growers, and we also have 12 other 12 independent businesses besides that. Mm -hmm. To give you an idea with a few facts on recreational marijuana, my building pays over $250,000, I mean $25,000 in taxes, employs 60 employees for part time. That's not counting the processes for the fishing industry, which are the urchin people. When they're working, it's 100 people a day. Mm -hmm. um, these growers, they work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There's always someone there. And on security, we've got 70 areas that are secured. We never very, very seldom we bother any police or firemen. Uh, 
security is taken care of by protection one. It's a highly protected area. Mm -hmm. So, and we take care of it ourselves. What kind what? of building do, do you operate? What kind of building? Yeah, is it? Well, we do um, or, uh, uh, light industrial. Yeah. Multi-story. And how many stories? Well, yeah, how many stories? Two stories. Mm -hmm. Well, there's uh, 20,000 of second story and 80,000 of uh, first, first story. story. Round level. That includes the railroad building also, mm -hmm. if you're familiar with the Mm -hmm. Familiar with the area? Yes. And you, people talk about um, smell. The only time you really smell uh, marijuana is when they're uh, harvesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. And normally they harvest in a special room, which they call a clean room. I don't say there's no odor whatsoever. There is. But even as the fish processors, the urchin people, we probably get more more complaint <laughs> on the urchin side than we do on the on the pot side. I bet. So, uh, like I guess we've never, I've never personally had a, anybody call me up and say they had a problem with the odor. So, but I have had a problem of people call me about the urchin people, mm -hmm. depending how late they, they go into the season. Usually they're all done by May, right. but, mm -hmm. but if they go a little bit beyond May, <laughs> then it comes into effect, just like any fishing industry right. does. So, do, do the people who rent from you uh, and operate the facility, do they take any special steps to control the odor? Any fans or, or any methods that when yeah, they're harvesting? Well, when they harvest, they do, yes. They have a special room that they harvest mm -hmm. in. And that room is filtered and uh, uh, clean air coming in all the time. But there is a, there is a smell. I'm not going to tell you there isn't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's down to a minimum. Uh, I think probably uh, if you have any bait shacks around down in Pine Point, it's probably a little bit worse than that. Yeah. yeah. So, like I say, it hasn't been a problem down yeah. in our place. It hasn't been a problem. Okay. So, and, uh, and I'm sure you people would be the first to know, if, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, that there was a problem there. Um, I guess if you get any questions for me, I try to. Uh, what, 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 what's, um, I don't. I don't grow. I'm not a grower. All I do is lease. Yeah, lease. Is Lease, no, it's uh, helpful to have somebody who's in the leasing business to a manufacturer of this so that we can get a sort of first-hand account yeah. of what your experience is because if, if you're going to have complaints, they're going to start to get directed at you. Right, and I take care of them. I'm yeah. That's my yeah. responsibility yeah. is to keep peace of the family. Yeah. And that's, <laughs> <laughs> so that's, you know, and, and there's always... Uh, the marijuana industry is very, very secret. Very. Oh, yeah. Everybody knows how to grow better than the next guy. Yeah. Oh yeah. You know, yeah. and nobody wants to tell the next guy how he, how he gets a quarter of a gram more out of a plant than the other guy did. Right. And they work by the gram. I mean, they're not working. You know, that's they, right. They, that's how it's, the industry is. They work by the gram. How much square footage is uh, dedicated to the uh, growing? Uh, probably around fifty thousand square feet. Mm. To give you an example, a guy that comes in, a, per, a, a, a popular size is 3,000 square feet. You know, for their flower room, buddy room, break room. Uh, it, it has to be all divided up. And that uh, comes through the stick. They're the ones that tell you how it's got to be done. And them growers, when they, when they come in here, when a grower comes in here, he always comes in with an investor. The guy that knows how to grow and the guy that's got a pocket full of money. Yeah. And I'll tell you, if you don't come in into that industry for 3,000 square feet, if you haven't got a quarter of a million dollars, yeah. I tell yeah. them, don't waste your time, because you're going to go broke. Yeah. You've got to get through that first harvest. And, and it's yeah. hard to get through the first harvest, because the first one there, and a lot of times things go wrong. These guys have a, you know, it isn't like growing radishes or tomatoes. Yeah. But, uh, you know, they, it, it, it's a science, and yeah. everybody has a secret how they do it. Mm -hmm. 
So I, is, I mean, that's, like I say, I don't, I'm not a grower. I do make yeah. sure they get the right equipment. Has there been much of a turnover? In other words, have you had different people come in and uh, lease space for this? Or have you had sort of one uh, uh, renter? No, the 12 different, 12, 12 different growers mm -hmm. that didn't know each other. They just came in here and wanted to lease space and the town of Scarborough was, was good enough to give us the uh, permits to do it. And, uh, matter of fact, Jim Butler's the guy who's in charge of it. Mm -hmm. Excellent guy that does business with, uses a lot of common sense. And whatever he wants, I make sure that it gets accomplished. I don't let him cut no corner. It has to be done just the way he does. I got a meeting with him again tomorrow morning. Uh, and he's there pretty steady. He keeps the place straight, and I make sure it happens. That's my part of the job. Mm -hmm. Do each of the 12 have 3,000 square feet? Pardon me? Each, each of the 12 have 3,000 square feet, is that what you were saying? Mm -hmm. Each of the 12 growers? Yeah, that's part. That, that, that's a mess. That's the minimum. Space. A guy can make this a decent living, and you know, 3,000 square feet is what it do, really do any of them have the, the storefront where people would come in and, and purchase, or are they, how, how are they? What do they do after they grow it? Well, now, when, it? I, I don't know. On a sales in it, I got no idea. Mm -hmm. I have nothing to do. Like I say, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't even smoke. It, does, it doesn't happen at your <laughs> facility, though. They don't, they don't have, there's no room where people could come in and But I do have one uh, that just started this morning. We got the permit for it yesterday. That we're going to have uh, medical marijuana there mm -hmm. that they're going to be able to sell. We're going to have a front of front. And, okay. You know, we got a permit for that. When you say, draw the distinction to medical marijuana, my understanding is all 12 are medical marijuana cultivators, but you're saying that there's a medical marijuana dis distribution is what's going to be coming in. Is that? I don't know. My daughter could handle that a lot better than I could. They're all medical. It's all med medical marijuana, basically, because recreation is not, is, is not allowed yet. Right. So, yes, they are all under the medical marijuana. Um, they, Do you mind going to the no, podium? They, they just got the they just got the okay. They just started uh, building the walls for the, the medical marijuana. Um, I guess you could call it retail, call it whatever word you want. But yes, they do have to have the medical card. And they just got that okay. And they just started putting uh, the walls up for that. Hmm. Um, they are all cultivators. You asked about a turn, uh, the turnover. I understand what you were asking. No, every grower that has come in there originally is still there. There's been no turnover. You hmm. you invest a quarter of a million dollars hmm. in, in 3,000 square feet, you're going to make sure it works. These people are business people. They're not just fly-by-nights. These people have a business plan, they have a direction they want to go in, and they know what that direction is. They're young, they're entrepreneurs, and they're very smart. They hmm. are. They You can't, it's not like to me, it's like indoor farming. I, I owned a grow space. I grew for five years. And to me, it's indoor farming. I, had, I worked seven days a week. Yeah. I worked 16 hour days. I didn't get, I was there Christmas, New Year's, birthday, anniversaries, every holiday. You have to be there because those plants don't take a day off. Yeah. So you don't take a day off. It's like a farmer, it's like an right. indoor farming, except that farmers have winters off. These guys don't. They work 12 months out of the year. Mm -hmm. So they know that when they go into these spaces, they know how hard or hard they have to work, and they know what they have to do to make money at it. Interesting. Can I ask a question about the, uh, so you have 100,000 square feet. What, what kind of vacancy rate do you guys have? So We're, you're pretty full? Uh, we are at, I'd say, about 95% full 95. right now. But, I mean, only half of them are growers. The other right. half are, are small businesses. Sure. We have uh, sheet metal. We yeah. have fuel trucks. We have uh, vitamin C. Um, we have... Uh, <laughs> sea urchins. Yeah. Sea urchins. So, I mean, it's not... It's, you know, half of it is grow, and half of it is small businesses. Huh. And they all, they all seem to, to get along. They all seem to, to, to you know, to work together. Mm. That's interesting. The, the, it sounds like the medical marijuana growing business has expanded and, and you've been fortunate enough to be a site where they've landed. If we didn't have the medical marijuana growing people there, we wouldn't have our building. I mean, yeah. We would only be half full. Half full. Yes. They, they've really, when, when the urchin people, what it is, is when the urchin people moved out because of the way the right. state regulated them, we, at one time we had 
seven, seven. urchin. We had seven urchin people there. Uh, they, they were the bulk of our rental. Um, but because what the state regulations and everything like that, they start they weren't making money anymore. They couldn't make money because of the state. So I, I tell you, um, thank God that the medical marijuana growers took an interest in our building it was and, and was interested enough to invest the money in. I mean, they updated the electrical. Mm. And that's what Jim Butler said that he liked about the medical marijuana growers is that because when they went in, they updated the electrical in there mm. because the electrical was old. They spent the money to do that. They updated the plumbing. They put a video surveillance system in. I mean, they spent a quarter of a million dollars in 3,000 square feet. Mm. You don't have, not every business will do that will make that investment, and they were willing to do that. That's why when you say you're going to limit the cultivation, that's, you're, you're taking away, you're, take, you're telling these people, you know, thank you very much for investing a quarter million dollars, but hey, you know what? See you later. It, it's, not, it, it's not right. It's not right at all. You've already told them, yes, go ahead and do this. We've given you permission to do this, but we're not going to let you grow. We're not going to let you move forward in this business because... And, and, and the competition doesn't exist outside. They don't, there's no, no one trying to run businesses for medical marijuana growing in uh, outdoors. Not in our area, no. Okay. I mean, I'm not, I can't say it, I can't speak for the whole state of Maine, but in, in our building, no, we don't allow outdoor growing. No, it's all indoors. Thank you. I just, I, I just wanted to, yeah, no, I just wanted to clarify. I don't think the discussion was about limiting the cultivation of the medical marijuana no. at all. I don't believe that we have the ability. You guys said something a little while ago about possibly when you ought limiting to the amount of percentage or something of the industrial zone to be used for that. Oh, oh, oh. And you're trying to make, sound like you're trying to save space made for other businesses. So I think I understand where your point was, but I could also see where that could have been. Uh, yeah, the discussion was around the, the recreational, if, if we would right. expand. But it, it sounds like. It's become a free for all industrial space. Yeah, but, but it, I take it you'd be in favor of allowing cultivation of recreational marijuana and in, in industrial. That's, that's how you grow, that's, that's how they move forward in this business. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, that, that's, that's their, that's these people who thought is, like, yes, you know, we're starting with medical marijuana. In order for me to make more money, yeah, let me get into the retail part of it also. It. It's, it. Not, it's another aspect, it's another way, to, another way for me to, to recoup that quarter million dollars I just invested in this building. Yeah. I see what you're saying. Yeah, so that's a good point. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah, go ahead, Larry. Be interesting to get assessing to, to assessing to inform us of the, the different values. values of different types yeah. of spaces. And yeah. Larry right, Bruns, Thirty Nine Hanson Road. Uh, just a couple of comments. Most of the growing going on in the state that is legal is taking place inside buildings, inside warehouses. Um, I don't think you're going to have much control over where these marijuana growers go as far as we'd like to retain space for these people over here. I don't think you could do that otherwise because these people have money. If they want your warehouse space, they're going to use it. Mm -hmm. If you read um, any of the trade uh, journals um, of uh, industrial sales groups, they've already got a pretty good hold on the warehousing market here in the Portland area. Um, Outside growing, probably you should limit that to homeowners, and that's that's going to be a difficult thing in and of itself. Uh, there are probably illegal operations in the state that are growing outdoors, but they most likely are illegal. There are no big. Well, I won't say there are none. I know I know of miracle marijuana that grow there, 36 plants outside, mm -hmm. and they can take up a, a considerable amount of space. Mm -hmm. um, but they're usually in a remote location. They're, you know, they've got their 40 acres someplace. They're not in somebody's backyards. Uh, but even the, but even with the medical marijuana, um, people that can grow at home, uh, you know, the state has a lot of regulations as far as you know how high fences can be and um, you know, and security and things like that. And you know, people that are growing for themselves are usually trying to skirt all of those laws as much as they can, get away with it as much as they can. Uh, because it's expensive to put up a 10-foot wall that nobody mm -hmm. can see over, but, but it's actually quite ineffective because 
once it starts to grow pretty well and it's a warm, breezy day, you kind of know what's going on on the other side mm -hmm. of the fence. Sure. And anytime you see one of those fences, when you drive by, you say, mm -hmm. I wonder what they're doing behind that 10 foot fence. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I th think I would not be afraid of uh, encouraging testing labs to come here. I, I think that's one thing that we've been lacking right from the beginning of the medical marijuana program is the state has had, uh, we have no way to test product legally. Okay, mm. So it's, uh, it's, it's, I think that's a very important step for people to take. And you're right, it probably won't take many production, many of those facilities here, um, but it's something that I think that we should encourage. Uh, it's something that's going to be, that testing is going to be required by all of these manufacturers for all of the product that they grow. So there will be, you know, there'll, there'll be busy labs. Um, that was one other point I was going to make. But anyways, I thank you for your uh, positive attitude moving forward with this. Uh, I, th I think you're on the right track. I'm, I'm not sure what I know what an opt-in policy is. I, I, um, but so if you could explain that for me, that would be great. But, uh, and, well, and I, I, would I can explain it, I think. <laughs> <laughs> it's when we have to affirmatively, and afterwards the town has to take action to allow something as opposed to it automatically being allowed. I think that's the easiest way to explain it, opt-in. So the state has said, yes, these things are legal within the state of Maine, but only if, if a municipality. The it. So in the state process, if a, if a grower or a manufacturer or a testing facility or a retail shop wishes to open, they have to get a provisional, a temporary license from the state that they then have to take to a municipality that has said, yes, this specific use is allowed within our town and get permitted by the town before they can get their actual acting license from the state. Yes. So it's a, it's a safeguard so that communities that do not wish to host do not have to in any way. Okay, so if I were to, to say I wanted to open up a retail store, mm -hmm. I'd go to the state, get my, do my pre-application work, then I have to come to you to get your permission to do it, then I get my final approval from the state. That's when I actually get my license to cultivate or to sell retail marijuana. Yes. And you couldn't get one from the town of Scarborough now because we have not passed right. any ordinance that specifically allows for any form of adult use marijuana activity in the town. And yeah. that's what this is about, is finding out which of the four, if any, or if all, does the council wish to enact. And it would, and it would be for everyone. So it wouldn't just be for Mr. Bruns, it would be for, <coughs> we, we would pass right. that ordinance. It's not an individual yeah. application. It right. would be, you just come to Tody at Town Hall to get the application. There would be an ordinance that says you can <clears throat> have a retail operation at these lo uh, at these zones so, uh, uh, in town. Yeah. So. But then I still go to Tony. Yes, yes. yes. Probably yeah. License, yeah. <laughs> yes. yeah, you'd still have licensing sure. requirements. Um, and I think the last point that they made was probably a very valid one. Probably most of the people that that have deep pockets behind them here. I know a lot of medical marijuana patients are operating on shoestring budgets, but. When you come in and spend two hundred thousand dollars on a three thousand square foot space, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you're positioning yourself for the retail market. Right, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else wish to comment? Uh, good afternoon, Larry Hartwell, Nine Period and Drive. I'm not a user, and I don't intend to go into business. <laughs> so I guess the only time I've inhaled is at a concert where. The MP the air is that way. Um, so I think we're talking about four different components of this, or four different parts of this marijuana law, and we're talking about maybe allowing three of them but not the retail. I think that's what I heard you guys say. Um, the grow houses and, and the odor, I, I don't know about that. You talked about limiting that because of the odor. Uh, I don't know if there's any way for those folks to control that or not, so I, I can't comment on that. I don't know. Um, the fact is, it's legal, it's legal, it's legal. Um, you can buy beer, wine, liquor anywhere in town. Um, you can buy prescription drugs at many places in town. Um, as far as, so I don't see a need to limit, to, to prohibit the retail. It's just another retail outlet. Um, 
people who use are going to buy the product. They're going to drive up Route 1. They're going to drive up Route 1 whether we sell it or not. Um, they're going to, and they're not going to reduce their consumption. They'll just simply buy it in another town. So I don't, I think that's an unnecessary prohibition. Um, it's kind of, I don't know what we expect is going to happen. I mean, people have been using mar marijuana for years. Uh, you know, there's not going to be some great change here. It's kind of like the debate on, on gay rights. Everyone thought, oh, or many people thought, oh, there's going to be big issues in town and so forth. Nothing, nothing changed there. Um, so I just would say, let's not jump the gun and say no to it because we don't know it. And um, as far as um, the police are concerned, they they don't go after, they don't aggressively go after people who use marijuana anymore. That's ancient history. Uh, they use their resources for, for more important things. So I think we should just simply allow retail sales, uh, license them like any other business. Thank you. Thanks. Anybody else? My name's Mike Shannon. I'm actually a resident of Saco, but I'm one of Henry's tenants down at Snow Cannon Road. My dad is a resident of Scarborough. Um, so my dad and I are actually sharing space together. Um, I moved him up from Florida. We decided to do this new venture. So speaking on some of the, you know, entrepreneurial side of things, you know, we did this with the intention of, you know, really zeroing in our science, or at least what we think. Um, and the way we've done our facility, and I, you know, we pride ourselves on having the cleanest facility. I welcome testing labs in all honesty, because I do think that probably half the growers in the state will be in a lot of trouble when that does happen. I think it's a really good health thing, um, you know, for the general public. Uh, from the business side of things, I am looking to expand now and get a retail location. I've been looking on you know, US Route 1, because my idea for me, and to answer some questions about how patients receive their medicine, their state doesn't say how they should receive it. It is up to the patients and the caregiver themselves. You can meet at the grocery store, you can come to the facility, we can go to their house, however. My idea is to make it a lot easier on my patients. You know, Pine Point, great location, Everyone loves to go down there, but if you're not going down there to go to the beach or for another purpose, it is a little out of the way. So we thought opening a retail location on you know, Route 1 would be great for our benefit and business as well as our patients' benefit. Um, I think it would allow us to use, as you alluded to, that fifth rotating spot. We've had plenty of you know, folks who have expressed that. We actually utilize that now. Uh, again, I think we could expand and grow on the amount of people, you know, that we can help that way. Um, I've basically spent an entire year, and I will say, seconding Shelley's, you know, 12-hour, 16-hour days, seven days a week, 365. Um, my father luckily volunteered to work holidays. I might have had five or ten days off in the whole year this year. Mm -hmm. Most of them were either family members' birthdays, or holidays, which I drove down to Massachusetts to visit them, and then right back up here. Um, it is definitely something that you have to take seriously. Um, and I do think that if you guys implement the right processes and procedures, the people that are working hard and for the right causes will be rewarded. The ones who aren't will, I think, find themselves either having to redo what or refigure out what they're doing or, you know, help open up more of a market to, like I said, those people who are, you know, trying to do things more for their patients, trying to help service the community. Do you, do you, do, do, do you service your uh, clients right out of your facility? Not often, just because of the location. Um, there have been times where they'll come down there, um, but yeah, that's, it's a little out of the way. Uh, it's not really a retail setup location, just like anything else. I give them the options of what we have available. You know, I explain to them, you know, and I'm not sure how much you know about it, but there's every different strain has different effects, different, you know, times of the days, better for pain, better for sleeping, all sorts of things. So 
typically what I'll do is I'll figure out what these people are looking for, what, how I can help them. Um, for example, I have one patient who was in a major car accident about six years ago. I didn't realize he seemed normal, walking normal, but you know he's in physical therapy three, four days a week, and he showed me a scarring recently. I said, "Oh wow!" So, you know, there was a couple strains that nobody really liked, but I kept around specifically for that you know one gentleman. So I know when he calls me, he's looking for one specific thing. Whereas, you know, when you have that rotating fifth person who you might not see as often that might make it a little more difficult. And sometimes I'll you know, tell them, hey, I'm not sure I have something that's perfect for you. This is what I have. It's up to you if you decide that you'd like to, you know, like to try that. And typically I'll offer, you know, offer them alternative options or offer you know, to do my best to maybe bring something in that might help them a little bit more. Uh, but sometimes that's just not feasible. So you actually only have four permanent clients. Uh, well, we have five, and then we, well, my father and I each, because we're family members, we can share the space, basically, so we actually have ten total, okay. and then when we do have someone else, we will rotate a spot out, it creates a little bit yeah. of paperwork, but yeah. not bad. Right, so delivery could be to their door. Yeah, it could be, yeah, and, that, and it is sometimes. Yeah, if it's inconvenient, or meet, I'll meet you a local spot. And yeah, well, and if, you know, some of the patients whatever have families. Whatever you know. convenient. Yeah, absolutely. We try to work together as much as we can on that. I got you. We just don't know anything about it. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Which is why we're asking rudimentary mm -hmm. questions. Well, and that's why I would like to get a storefront up on a busier road that is allows someone, you know, who's <clears> on the way home from work, instead of having to go all the way down Pine Point and back up, that they can just go. Since we're can. sort of out... Out, out of the medical marijuana business, does our ordinance that allows for the retail sale of stuff have any prohibition against the uh, medical marijuana industry setting up a retail store? I cannot imagine that it does because we aren't right. in the... I, I can check with Jay to confirm that, but mm -hmm. I feel like where we... Do, oh, or Ryan. Brian? <laughs> what do I know? I'm only the zoning administrator. <laughs> My Gee, apologies, Brian. Just popped up out of the. Can you, yes, uh, Brian? Do you mind going over sure. there? Just some people who may be being up. recorded, or. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as far as we can determine, Brian Longstreth, I'm the zoning administrator in Scarborough. As far as we can determine. Um, the retail medical marijuana storefront could happen anywhere where any other retail uh, would be permitted because we can't not permit it as yeah. far as I know I so we would treat it until we're told otherwise we treat it like any other retail establishment it's a legal product it's a legal product right. and, yeah. and it's lawfully sold to pe people who have the card that says they're entitled to it. So. And in just up until recently, as in like a day or two ago, <laughs> I wasn't even sure. What I wasn't sure of is if you had a cultivation or a processing facility, if you could sell out of that processing facility. And I had to actually do a little digging to find out. I just didn't know. Hmm. So, so it was kind of interesting to listen to the discussion around the industrial zone mm -hmm. um, in that little caveat that it allows retail sales if it's a product that you're processing. So that kind of answers that question. So that's that's what I know about the medical side of things. Um, there's all kinds of questions about the adult use so, side of things. So uh, someone could do it without getting any special permit. Right. Because when right. Hannaford, it doesn't require a special when Hannaford sells products, It would be just like any other retail sales, a certificate of occupancy for that yeah. particular space would be but required. As long as it's medical marijuana. Yeah. Um, and, and to back up to, uh, there was a comment earlier on that, that there isn't any, any uh, growing going on in the rural farm district. There is. Okay. We've, we've permitted facilities in the rural farm district. Oh, we weren't sure oh. when medical marijuana came out because we weren't getting a lot of assistance from the state as far as what are we supposed to do with this. Yeah. Um, we looked at it, it's either an agricultural process, cultivation, or it's a processing or manufacturing process. So either the industrial zone or the rural farm district huh. could work. And if you choose to grow outside, there's no prohibitions about mm -hmm. that. There are some state, 
I think, state best practices or perhaps regulations, but they're not ours to enforce. Um, we only would permit a building. So there are a few that are have retail, retail, a few that have cultivation facilities in the rural farm district. Mm -hmm. so. And they might be indoors or they might be outdoors. They could do either mm -hmm. or both. Because they have greenhouses yeah. and, and outbuildings. Absolutely. I'm not sure. Again, I'm not a grower, and I don't know enough about it. It's fun to listen to the folks that do it because I'm a, I'm a potato farmer <laughs> <laughs> from Arusta County. So <laughs> this is a different process, but um, it's fun to listen to them. Uh, you know, um, I, I'm not sure what the quality is like if you grow outdoors mm -hmm. as opposed to indoors. I'm sure mm -hmm. the controls might not be as great, so I, I don't know much about that part of it. But as far as the where it can exist, those are the two places right now that we know we can permit or we feel comfortable that we can permit it. Okay. I think it should also um, be clear that if the council chooses to opt in to either, uh, to any of these four um, oh. options, my understanding in the, in the state law itself, um, section 501 of the law that governs um, adult use, is they have very clear operation guidelines and one of the things that is very clear, which is different from the medical production, is it explicitly prohibits, if you are licensed by the state as a cultivation facility, you are um, expressly prohibited from also being a retail facility. You as a cultivation facility can sell to other li state ho license holders in manufacture or testing or retail, okay. but they themselves cannot, by state law, um, have a retail front. So just so that we're just aware of that, um, because home rule allows you to be more restrictive, but it does not allow you to be more lenient, um, our zoning that does allow, like for instance in the industrial zone, that section 13 that we were talking about, that would not apply to manufacture or testing or cultivation that was taking place mm -hmm. in that zone. They would not be able to have a storefront the way that medical marijuana is able to have a storefront. Mm -hmm. just to That's good to know. Uh, my suggestion, for what it's worth, is to start with the survey portion, just so that we can get an idea of, of what the community is thinking before we bring this to the full council. Absolutely. Um, and then move it from there. I, I, I'm, this is me. I'm thinking the timeline for surveying is this summer. Because we do, we have summer fest. We have, you know, activities and, and whatever. Um, and um, I, I would say, Marissa does a really good job with communications and getting that out. We wanted to direct her to do that. Is that something you? Do you want me to? So I'm happy to, of course. And Jimmy will be helping. He's the one who oh. wrote you your memo. Um, okay. He's our intern for the summer. So I do Jimmy Bustle. <laughs> um, so. <laughs> um, so are you comfortable with Jimmy and I working up survey questions and, and working on that survey or would you prefer for us to come up with a draft survey that we present to you at your July meeting and then execute the survey which I just want to know what you would like to have happen with that as soon as you have a, a good first draft I'd love to have the three of us review it yeah. send it to us electronically yeah. and get feedback back and then uh, I don't think July, we need to wait till the meeting. Then at the July meeting, we can uh, authorize it, or before the July meeting, if the there's a consensus around a draft. Okay. Yeah, that's how I. And that would be the first step. And then this, we can continue discussion. Because the focus of the right. survey would be on retail. Well, I think that I heard from Excuse Will me, that on he would like on adult use, all four adult. versions of adult yes. use. Um, and as we, as Jimmy mentioned in his memo, we we do like the idea of surveying, um, finding out what is the what is the interest in, and and tolerance for those that so adult use marijuana did not pass in the town That's of Scarborough. Right. Right. So has that tolerance increased? As people have seen other community, as as people become more comfortable with medical marijuana, as people become more comfortable with this being state law, would we see a different vote in Scarborough today? And mm -hmm. finding out where are people comfortable? Yeah, I would say that's the first step, and then we can work from there. Does that make sense to you guys? Great. Yep, All right. Cool.
Thanks, everyone. Thank for you. Providing us that input. Much more to stay yeah. for signs. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Thank you. Was it enticing offer? Thank you. Thanks, Larry. <laughs> signs, signs. Everywhere are signs. <laughs> so. All right, so the reason I bring up signs is because, to be honest with you, I get tired of getting emails from people because I'm the ordinance chair complaining about signs <laughs> and where they are and who's doing what and why and blah, 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 blah. So I thought that, you know, given that we just finished particularly a political cycle, because that's when you see the most signs, yeah. uh, and we're heading into another political cycle, and the first day where you can place signs, if I counted back correctly, is around September 25th. Yeah. is if we are really clear as to is this working, isn't it working, does anything need tweaking, you know, what should we be bringing, if anything, to the town council. So I'm going to open up the floor. Actually, I'm going to, can I start with Larissa or and or? I, I actually would love to Brian pass or fully somebody. to Brian and Tony. Okay, okay, that'd be great. That'd be awesome. You're up. You're up, Brian. <laughs> Um, yeah, I don't really actually have a lot. I was, I was thinking there were going to be more people here to talk about it, but um, my observations are that um, there are some specific people that are, have taken on the role of sign police, and we get calls from them whenever there's a sign that they, they feel is um, non-conforming or non-compliant. And um, we've certainly instituted some things. We now have the sign patrol on Thursdays. Uh, from 9 o'clock to 10.30. <laughs> we just, just dedicating one day to, a week to go out and, and go up and down Route 1 and uh -huh. Payne Road and, and look around. That doesn't mean we're going to catch them all, but we, we, we do that. Um, a lot of people feel that something's not compliant, but they, they haven't actually um, gotten out to look at it. So one of the, the misconceptions that we get, you know, if you look at the letter of our our regulation, it talks about contact information, or it actually says name and phone number. We've broadly construed that to mean if we can identify who put the sign out there, for example, if it's a business sign with a website address or, or whatever, or if it just has a phone number and no actual person's name but the business name, we, we, we take that at face value and say we know who put that sign out there. We can call them if it's non-compliant. We get a lot of complaints that those stickers or somebody didn't write their name and phone number on it. So, but it is pretty consistent with the state regulations. And I think the state says name and address, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. I think contact information of any kind, if it's an email address, if it's, if it's a phone number, if it's a business name, I don't think that we need to get that particular. We're, we're, we're happy if we can identify that. That's one, that's one of the complaints I get from the sign police that are out there is that mm -hmm. they saw a sign without somebody's name and phone number on it. Uh, the other, I think maybe more pressing issue um, that I've heard some complaints about is the 30-foot setback at intersections. It's problematic for a number of reasons, and I, I, I think I know what the intent of that was. I think I remember back when we were developing the ordinance and what the intent of that was. It was had to do with public safety and not, you know, blocking the intersection and stuff, but it really doesn't matter if you're within 30 feet of the intersection or back 30 feet of the intersection. If you're running across a busy highway to stick a sign in the median strip or to put one over on the other side of the street, the danger is really in putting the sign up. It's not, once, once the sign's there, it doesn't really matter if it's right at the intersection or 30 feet back. I don't really see a, a I don't see a super safety issue with that. It's the activity of putting the sign up that's dangerous in my, in my estimation, and also dangerous if we have to go collect them. <laughs> so, so when we see one that's 25 feet from the intersection um, and, and a code officer actually has to somehow navigate over there to get it, that's, that's a problem. I, I don't like that aspect of it myself. Mm -hmm. The other problem with it is our public works department did a nice job in marking, actually marking where on the curbing I think at every of the, every one of those intersections that is noted in our ordinance, but the paint wears off yeah. after a time and people have a hard time seeing where that is. Mm -hmm. So it's problematic for a number of 
those reasons, I guess. Um, uh, the timing thing, I think one of the differences I noted in the state's regulations is they required that somewhere on the sign it be noted how long yes. of duration it's going to be out. We, we put in our ordinance that it can't be up for more than six weeks, so it's kind of hard if you don't put a date on when you actually placed it, it's kind of hard to regulate how long that's actually been there. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, frankly, is that a big issue? Um, it's probably likely to blow away before six weeks are over with. It'll probably end up somewhere else. So I, those are just a few of my, my comments about the, the current ordinance. I, I don't think, you know, as far as an enforcement issue, if it's there, we'll enforce it. Obviously, for the most part, it's not life safety stuff. It's not, it's not um, immediately dangerous to the public, so we, we put it in a priority order. We'll take the ones in the, in the, the natural resource protection areas, or the ones that we want to preserve the, the resource. Those take a highest priority. Uh, the ones in the intersection are maybe second, and then the ones without the name and number on them are probably third on our priority list. So we, we get to them when we can. Um, and that's sort of how we've handled it. Uh, that hasn't satisfied a few folks in town, but it, I think it's, I think we're doing a pretty decent job at, and, and Todi gets calls and she lets us know and we go out, you know, and, and uh, do it. But now we've instituted sign patrol day, so we'll, we'll be able to manage it a little bit better. My observation has been that <clears throat> enforcement in uh, uh, signs being where they're not supposed to be is not the principal um, enforcement issue that's being raised by sign police. That it's more that the contact information or the listing of the date of posting is doesn't appear readily apparent on the signs. But that when I go by the places that we've identified as signs shouldn't be like the Scarborough Marsh on Route 1 and the few other locations. I never see signs in those locations. Mm -hmm. So my guess is that part people are attuned to and abiding by. Is that consistent with your... I think it's 50-50. I mm. think people are paying attention to it and we're picking them up. Those are the ones that we pick up. We don't even call Toady to let... You know, it's not like a, a political enforcement's sign. easy. You... Well, you know that's it's not, right. You know it's not supposed to be there. That's For you true. to get out of your car and look at a sign that says free football lessons next week requires some time and effort that you have a limited resource. And so I... That's been my explanation to people is, you know, we're not going to just stop and check, randomly check signs <clears throat> to see if a name and a number right. and a date is on them. If they're, if they're compliant in every other way, Right. We're not going to take our time to do that. If mm -hmm. somebody else wants to take their time to do that, that's fine. But we're, we're looking for signs that are either not in the proper location, intersections, or, or uh, sensitive resource areas. And, and those are our highest priority. And in, if, if I notice a sign stayed somewhere for a long time, and again, I don't, I don't write the day down that I see that sign, but if I know it's been quite a long time, I might stop, I might pull over and and you know and, and take a look at it but i'm not going to pull over and look at every sign to see if they've got a name yeah. or a number or a date yeah. on them just not going to do it i know the uh complaints that i get via phone call or quick emails are these location things these 30 foot from the corner Tody, what's been your experience the same also if they're the same sign and they're not the 30 feet apart oh okay yeah mm. but i Tori, yeah, do you want to go ahead yeah. and talk about um, your experience? The biggest or? complaint was, again, the dates on the signs and the location. Um, this is a new ordinance. A lot of the candidates were not aware that we did not allow signs within a certain area, a certain intersections, and they I still have a quite, quite a collection of signs in the back <laughs> office. So um, the dates, I think people know, like the state law for right. political signs, they're six weeks prior. Uh, we did make a sweep of, I had the VIPs go out and they cleaned up what, what they found along Route 1, Payne Road, 114, and, and uh, we still had quite a bit. But I, the one compliment that I did hear from people was the fact that the intersections were clear. Hmm. 
and I agree with Brian, the paint's kind of worn off, and we need a brighter color. Uh, so I would like to see that stay. That, that was a very that. soft green, wasn't it? <laughs> I know, you can't green. see that it's hard to read. Yeah. Yeah. But that was effective to just give people a heads up. I don't know why we couldn't put a sign out, Bill. Well, that's <laughs> what I think. Yeah, let's put a sign, no signs. I think that's a song. It's a good lyric to a song. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> what do you, from an education Fine. aspect, what do, what do you... What do you think? Every every election cycle, we're going to have new candidates. Right. It, it's always going to be education. It, you know, we're going to have to re-educate people every single time. Like, does that well, concern you at we all? Know, we know that we we'll probably know who the list of candidates are that are coming up in November. Mm -hmm. So, I will email the the now whether they read it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> at least mm -hmm. I've sent it to them. Uh, when they came this this cycle around uh, this last election when I made contact with everyone that had signs, um, I gave them a handout. So you need, you know, the rules have changed. Mm -hmm. This is just for Scarborough. Uh, please, you know, make sure your people who are putting signs out are aware of this. And they all agreed. Some of them didn't comply, but. Is the map in there? This is fantastic, by the way. This, I don't know yeah. this together. Oh, this, I, this I, yeah, no, this was not yeah. in it, but I will make sure it's. it's yeah, this is. This that, makes it way easier. Map, yeah. Yeah. Um, so the complaints that, my interpretation of a lot of the complaints has been more around fairness, where mm -hmm. some people are following and the, the people who are not are thereby getting benefit because they're getting their, uh, name, their name out there. there. And, and so that's why I think the enforcement is important. I do take, you know, hadn't really considered the safety factor of our enforcement officers that have to go into the middle of these intersections and pull the signs. I think that's definitely something to consider yeah. when, uh, while I appreciate that the intersections have been clear, I don't know that we, from the, the public safety benefit, what, it wasn't just putting out the signs, it was also the distraction around. The, the driver distraction, right. checking out signs as they pass through the intersection. So I think that's, that's also, also worth uh, a discussion. The other thing, I think um, one thing that um, a business owner mentioned to me after we passed the, the sign ordinance last time was around the, the banner signs. Um, when we went through and we made it content neutral, mm -hmm. they used to have two banner signs where one could say the word open. Um, and then when we said content neutral and the other one could, could say something, um, uh, what we said was, well, we can't restrict signs based on what it says. Um, and so we went, we effectively took one of their banners away, which was kind of like a thing that says, hey, we're here. Um, and so I wonder if, if we are gonna make changes, if we wouldn't be comfortable just taking that from one banner to two banners back to two banners. Brian, do you have a thought on that? One of the biggest complaints I get is about banners oh, yeah. in general, period. People don't like them. Mm -hmm. um, they're oftentimes in disrepair. They're oftentimes very distracting. And the only way they could have two banners was if one said open. There were a lot of businesses that illegally had two banners, three banners, four banners, yeah. and those are the ones that we had to constantly go visit. Um, and asked to take down, and sometimes we got compliance for a day, a week, a month. Um, you know, and, and it's a nuisance thing. It's not something that we're going to go spend time to write a notice of violation for and pursue three three notices and then send it to the town's attorney. It's just one of those nuisancey things that on a slow day we'll stop back by and mention that you got too many banners. So banners in general, I'm not in favor of. As a, of allowing that's, any at all. Yeah, I, I'm not in favor of them at all. Mm -hmm. So they're lucky. Because I don't have a vote, they're lucky they got one. <laughs> but uh, that's, that's how I feel about it. But uh, I, I understand exactly what you're saying. It is sort of like, hey, I got something taken away from me. If I was one of the compliant ones that had an open and, and a legal, otherwise legal one. Um, so, so yeah, that was sort of a little bit of a takeaway. But I think if you've noticed on Route 1 lately, it's a lot less cluttered mm -hmm. with with those banners, those feathers um, that we've seen so many times, and, and uh, there's still a few, still a few dragging their feet, and we'll be back to visit them again. But um, yeah, that's my thought on that. I'd prefer not to go back to two banners. Um, I think keeping it at one banner per lot is the way to go. It, it's difficult for multi-tenant places too because they only get one per lot, not per business. Uh -huh. <laughs> so okay. if everybody wants a banner, they have to rotate days. <laughs> hmm. Interesting. I, I thought the feedback I was getting on the 
ordinance was that it would be a lot easier if we had uh, a requirement that the information on the sign be consistent with the state. Right. Uh, but I like this idea of contact information, mm -hmm. which is, again, not the state says address. But what you're saying is any contact information that is sufficient to allow us to identify who they are for the purposes of contacting them mm -hmm. to say, your son's in the marsh area, get it out of there. Uh, I'm not sure why the, the violation is. I'm not sure why the state went with address. That's the slowest possible way of contacting mm -hmm. somebody, and I just feel like There's it's some quicker compromise to somewhere. zip them a, a phone <laughs> it call is, or It email. is time consuming because I had to go online and look for information in order to contact the candidates that I had to contact. And I spent a good 45 minutes just trying to find, I mean, the website was there. If, if you had your druthers, what would the ordinance say as far as, would it say phone number, address, email address, or would it say contact information? I think a name and number would be great. I mean, at least you'd have a, a phone number to call. Because that's what we have now is name and phone number. Mm -hmm. And that's, I always thought that that would allow you most or efficiently. Or even the organization in the phone number. Some, something, I think um, you have contact information. Uh, the, only, the only issue I can think of having been a candidate a few times is, you know, if, if the state's got one rule, mm -hmm. but the town's got another rule, and I'm running in more than one town, yeah. it gets then, very confusing, and you don't know... It's, to consistent. me, it's easier to have it all one. Now, I happen to put phone numbers on mine because I figured it's contact information to me as a phone number. You know, just on the tag. I'm one of those tags people. <laughs> <laughs> the sad you know? thing is, is candidates weren't even complying with the state Oh, I know, the state rules. I saw that. <laughs> so, I saw what's on them. I know. But if we were going to do one, then comply with what the state, mirror what the state does. The complaint that I recall about the phone number was that um, some individuals did not want their phone yeah, number that's right. out yeah, that's in public. Right, yeah. and so, I mean, it took I a little digging to find information, but I was able to number. contact all the candidates. Yeah. I guess with the address, you can just pull the sign and deliver it to them. That well, might. exactly. <laughs> um, Larissa did give us a sheet that's got some yeah. potential. Suggested draft language changing phone number to contact information. I mean, just a reminder, again, we can't be more lenient for than the state. We can be right. more restrictive. Right. But I don't think that it's more lenient to say contact right. information than address. I don't think that that's more lenient. I think that that's... Right. I, but I would welcome your opinion on that, certainly. Um, and then just adding the words or organization responsible for after mm -hmm. the word person so that it would, it mm -hmm. would read, mm -hmm. all signs shall be removed... I'm um, sorry, all temporary signs in the right-of-way will include the name and contact information of the person or organization responsible for placing the sign. Mm -hmm. And that would then... I mean, if, if... At that point, you don't need to have somebody's name separately with the contact information. If the sign is for Bill Donovan, we assume that right. that's the organization that's placing the right. sign. Right. And the contact information would yeah. allow for an address, a phone number, a website. Now, on Because what we're doing is, if the sign were stuck in the Scarborough Marsh on Route 1, we just pick it up and you'd have somebody pick it up and deliver it to Toady and it sits there. Right. And she contacts and I contact the for me, I contact the candidates, or in some cases, the I think the football boosters, I have some of their signs. You use whatever contact right. information is on there mm -hmm. to say, we've got your sign. Right. It's at Town Hall. Yeah. You paid money for it. You should come get it. <laughs> um, you also have down here just something that... I don't know why that's red. I, uh, I, I didn't know if that's I the original. Like that was, I thought it was already in there, but um, maybe it was added. Jimmy, do you remember when we did the... Item first thing on item five: the town of Scarborough requirements for signs in the right of way are in no way meant to contradict this the requirements outlined in. I thought that was part of our original language, but it's underlined red, which suggests that we've added it in. On the back page is the <coughs> town ordinance as it is written on the website. Okay, so that is additional language then. So that is new language, making it clear that we are not trying to contradict the state which language. Means, which makes sense to me. And then it also... It kind of cross reference. Yep, and that blue just means that it's hyperlinked, so yeah, people yeah. can go directly to the yep. state language. Mm -hmm. And that's right. Thank you, Jimmy. Jimmy put this together as well. Um, <laughs> on the back is the state statute that's yeah. regarding temporary signs in the right of way, and then the town language, so that you can easily right. compare. Thanks. 
So I guess for me the big question is this 30 foot from the intersection. I mean, I'm hearing one thing from Brian saying when they go to clear it, if they have to clear them, and I also see them in medians, which drives me crazy, people sticking them yeah. in the middle of the highway and whatever. Um, and I never did that as a candidate that I know of. But oh, know. I did. You did? Oh, sure. oh geez. Anyway. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, That's a tough one, you know. You know, do we want to keep, but the, yet Tony, who's in charge of getting all the phone calls, she's like, no, I kind of like having a... I do like the, the intersections, not just me personally, but right, everybody. Right, right, I know, I've we've heard with. that. The and only input I, I got back like was it. it was nice to see it not in the Vista view areas, and it was good to not clutter up the he major is, intersections. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the only input I got back. The, uh, the only except for the people who were the police who said, but I assumed that when we were getting that information, it always seemed to relate to uh, not having the proper contact information that we required. Or, you know, say it was posted at this date and will be picked up on this date. Um, or it didn't have a phone number. That was, <clears throat> so I thought maybe 90% of what we were being asked to address as conflicts was that the information on the sign wasn't adequate. Right. <clears throat> that, at least that's what I got in my office also. Was they weren't labeled, they didn't have the right information. Yeah, right. So, or somewhere in the wrong location. So what are your thoughts on, on that? I can go either way with it myself. On the, on the intersection? I th yeah. go either way too. I, I think, I guess I, I just have some, I'm just not convinced that there's enough of a public safety harm in having them in there mm -hmm. to warrant saying that they shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I well, but while I do, I do appreciate the cosmetics of not having them there, right. I, just, I just don't know that, that it's right. true that, that, that there's any higher threat to public safety mm -hmm. in those intersections. And they are the high crash intersections. Oh, absolutely. But I think they would they are regardless, just because of the high traffic. Uh, but I, I could be convinced to, to leave it because I again I'm I don't Do we want to bring it to the council and have the this discussion with the full council? I mean we've got to win anyway, but I mean I since I what's what's your reaction to the rule that that signs uh, have to be at least thirty feet apart? Well, that's, that's, state state rule. that's a state rule. That's a state rule. And the state modified their, because they had a political ordinance statute that required that, and then they realized that that was co not content neutral. Right. So they now they have. Tested. They have what they also call a, their temporary signs placed within the public right of way. Right. right. And one changed. of them is that. Um, 30 feet. 30 feet of the signs. So, so it's, it's statutory. Yeah. Yep. So, and actually that reminds me of another concern that I had was... Well, uh, it doesn't say from a corner. No, I mean, but that's, that's it. I mean, I kind of go, I liked the corner because it kept the corners un, uh, right. uncluttered. Right. And the 30-foot separation is, that's just defining the 30-foot separation as starting 30 feet from the corner. Right, that you can't put 15 <laughs> Donovan signs like boom, 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 boom. Right. Yeah. Yep. And I, when you start to count the 30 feet separations, you start 30 feet from the, those six corners. I guess that's the way I would look at that. I'm suggesting we ask the council for input on this myself on that. Uh, and you might it's actually report third. out the discussion. Yeah. And, uh, Say, and have hey, it as I'd like to hear from a, everybody. Um, yeah. More as not trying to bring something to them, but we'd like right, to have a robust a, discussion. A discussion. Is this working? Do we should we keep this? And did, remind me, did we leave in around the turning lane? Wasn't there something that we considered? So, so the turning lane is still considered. Right. It's, it's, it's from the, thirty feet from the <coughs> turning from lane. From the point at which the yeah. curve ends. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And if we and if we keep all of this, then I'm going to ask that they make the paint a little more visible. Yeah. yeah. Is that green paint? It's hard to see even when you're standing right in front of it. Bring it down on the, uh, the other, <laughs> the other concern that I recall having about the signs was 
we got some feedback about the identical content, the way that we were describing those 30 feet, because we said if it had a different, oh. uh, there was something about being, and I'm not recalling exactly, but there was something about if the, the way that we were distinguishing, because we couldn't talk about the content, but the, that they were the same sign was if the um, content was identical, do you recall? No, so same or similar. We same had the words similar. same or similar. We got some That's pushback stupid. from a couple of residents about that language. And I believe that we then changed it to just saying same in our current language. Gotcha. Um, the state language is same or substantially right. the same. same. Gotcha. Um, and I, th I think the, the concern that we had around the, and this was in November 2017, was that um, they weren't the same sign, but they were supporting the same candidate, and they were right next to each other. And I'm, I'm not sure if we have clear, clarity on, is that sufficiently the same if they both say, elect Will Rowan? And this one says, vote for Will Rowan, or that, does that make them? I think the state language could very well be interpreted, because the state language is clear. Bill's got it in front of him. Um, may I go? So the state language says, a temporary sign may not be placed within 30 feet of another temporary sign bearing the same or substantially the same message. Right. And I think it would be hard to argue that vote for Will Rowan or elect Will Rowan was not substantially the same message. Um, we, had the, um, we had temporary signs in the right of way shall not be placed within 30 feet of another bearing the same, and we originally had or similar message. Mm -hmm. But through the drafting process, we had, like I said, pushback from a couple of residents. We pulled the words or similar. The pushback we received was that that was too vague, that we were then putting people in a position of interpreting what similar meant. Right, right. And so we took that language out. Mm -hmm. um, I think you could argue that our ordinance is in violation of, I think we've now made our ordinance slightly more lenient than the state's, right? Because we've you could interpret the same yeah. meaning to be identical. Mm -hmm. And the state has said, no, that's not the intent of this. The state has said very clearly, same or substantially the same. So we could one of the edits we could do is to simply use the exact same right. language as the state. Right. Mm. That's, that's a good point. What, what if there were two different organizations that were both supportive of the same, the same candidate? Um, <laughs> that, I mean, just, just curious of your opinion I, on how to. I don't think I have an that. opinion. OK. <laughs> that's a good answer. <laughs> Good question. Yeah. Are you plotting something? No. <laughs> just saying that. Just trying no. to. I know. Yeah. I mean, this can take on all sorts of iterations, uh, and people can find all sorts of uh, of questions and concerns. But all right. So I think what we're doing here is. So do you want for your, when you bring this to council, would you like me to update the draft that was printed, presented to you in your agenda packet with the state language of same or substantially the same included for them to, to discuss adopting the changes that were presented to you here as well as the larger discussion about the intersections? Or do you not want to present them with any draft language until after your conversation and then we'll bring that draft language to you in July? I lean towards draft language with the discussion. I think it's a good starting point. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. we'll have that ready for, so yeah. the next council meeting is July 5th, 18. 18. Oh, and you guys are scheduled for the 19th. Yes. Okay. Yes, I guess we are. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak on this? Are we all? Yeah. So I'm Annalie Name? Rosenblatt yeah, I'm from Tall Pines Road. I watch you on TV. I don't <laughs> usually come to speak, and I'm sorry I'm late. You may have already covered this, but I raced from South Paris and had a time for what I thought was a six o'clock meeting. So I was good for that, but I'm <laughs> late for you. So um, let me just, um, so I don't feel quite as organized, but I just want to make a few comments. <clears throat> One is that there are really some good changes in this ordinance. And um, I don't know whether it all started with a meeting, a chance meeting with, um, with Councillor Donovan on the corner one day when we were fixing signs that were blowing over and I commented to you, you know, Brunswick has an ordinance, no signs, and right. as we were picking them up and repairing hmm. them. So the next thing I know, we were having an ordinance. So I think that's really good that we um, 
you know, got some clarifications in there. I believe also some of the restrictions on where signs can go is a real positive thing. Um, certainly the busy corners, the marsh, some of those scenic areas look really great. The problem I see with the sign ordinance, and I'm going to mention some specifics, is one, enforcement. Um, it's, in my opinion, it's been enforced erratically, and the time spent on enforcement by staff I think it's wasted time. It's not very productive time. Um, and the number of violations are, seem to be overwhelming. Um, so there seems to be no enforcement provisions. I think Tody's idea to have the VIPs at least to go down and clean up the major intersections was, was a really good idea. Um, even though the signs had been up more than a week before that happened. So, they weren't taken down right away, and um, so the nature of the violations that you thought were they were at the up. at the intersections, the major intersections where they weren't supposed to be, were overwhelmed with signs that shouldn't have been there. Forget what the stickers or if yeah. that stuff was on there, and it took too long to enforce because I don't think staff has time to do all of that. So the enforcement mechanism needs to be addressed so that it's done swiftly fairly and even-handedly. Secondly, it was not enforced um, on streets where there were not major intersections. Many of the signs for the statewide candidates did not have the proper sticker that was unique to Scarborough on them, and those were left up the whole time. And so um, I think if we're going to have that in the ordinance, then it needs to be enforced, and a way to do it has to be figured out. But I would suggest that the town of Scarborough does not need to have additional information on their signs beyond what the state requires um, to have sufficient information to know who's posting them, how long they're going to be posted, and if you needed to contact them. That's all on the signs. And I anticipated that <clears throat> there were going to be problems because certainly with 7, 11, governor <coughs> candidates and add all the others in, that they were not going to be aware of the unique qualifications to post signs. So I would ask you to look at changing the content of what needs to be on a sign to be consistent with state law so that in statewide races and in federal races that the signs are correct. Because for you to say, well, we're going to take them down in the corners, but we're not going to take them down along... Um, Gorm Road because it's just overwhelming and when they're not in compliance just doesn't seem correct. I think also um, you need to come up with some kind of uh, penalty, I think, um, and I'm speaking for myself here. I noticed when there was a lot of controversy about the Max Lynn sign and, and them going up in New Hampshire, the town in New Hampshire talked about what the consequences were for people who didn't take down the signs. So I thought it was a bit harsh, <laughs> and I'm not advocating the penalty. And for those who didn't read it, the paper, and again, I'm relying on the newspaper for my information, which can be hazardous, but um, they said that they notify the offender, and they have 24 hours to take the sign down. And if it's not taken down in 48 hours, the town takes it down, and they have a $50 per sign fine. Um, for those signs, and it makes people pay attention in the first 24 hours. So I think that's uh, extreme, but there has to be a consequence. There's absolutely no consequence to ignore any calls from Toady. Um, so that's in regard to the temporary signs and the, and the issues with the political signs. Um, as I winged my way at, over the speed limit down Route 1 into coming into town, I counted 13 signs that were not in compliance with the current sign ordinance. Um, so, and some of those have been up a while. One of them I noticed yesterday is in the major intersection where Tody drives through to work. I, maybe she caught it, because I haven't been there today. But the sign for the book sale is right on the corner of the Cumberland Station. Um, and they're not supposed to be right on the corner. Um, I noticed that sign, because it's pretty, pretty large. Now, I'm not against the book sale, and I'm not against the booster clubs, but the same rules apply to them. Those football signs have been up a month. 
They're still up today. That was three or four of the signs just from there to town hall. So we need to look at changing the rule or enforcing it. But to enforce it haphazardly based on the time of the people that have at town hall, Cody, I don't know who does the booster signs. I know code enforcement, or I understand code enforcement does the business signs. There's still violations of that. Um, some have the two banners uh, still up. Two, they're right across down here by town hall, one you can see out the window, which we pointed out last week or a week ago when we met on another issue that O'Reilly's is in violation of the flag sign, and I think the car wash is in violation, and they're pretty and I'm not against those. I don't think they look bad, but it's, they're only supposed to have one, not two. And the other businesses uproot one did take theirs down. So I had, um, I thought I'd have time today to work on it. I printed it all up. I just wanted to give you some overviews of what I've noticed um, and that there's a lot of good things about it, but there's some things that really do need to be looked at more carefully. So thank you. Thanks. Just so you'll know, Annalie, I just found out that they are doing sign patrols every Thursday morning now. They've started them. So hopefully well, that will help. Well, this is Thursday afternoon, and they're still up. 13 of them from there yeah. to Oak Hill. Well, I'm just letting there. you know they're just starting it. So. Well, they didn't. They must have been All right. Anyway, anyone else wish to speak? Uh, Larry Hartwell, Nine Period and Drive. Um, the reason for the rewrite or was the the uh, state, state uh, the Supreme Court one on content neutral regulations or ordinances. Um, we did that, <clears throat> but we don't enforce it that way. We enforce it on political signs. We specifically we uh, uh, enforce it on local political signs. We have all these business signs and banners that come under that neutral ban, uh, neutral regulation, and yet, as, as um, Annalie just mentioned, we have the folks across the street and the car wash with two banners. Again, we don't have a pro I don't have an issue. No, most people don't have an issue with having two flags up, but you wrote the ordinance. You expect compliance with the ordinance. Our, our gentleman over here, who is the code enforcement officer, if we have an ordinance on plumbing and, and how, how you build a house, we don't haphazardly look at one place, another, and we miss 10 or 12. We expect it throughout the community. And the enforcement is, is difficult, and it's a waste of time. So, so are you saying we shouldn't have any rules at all? No. And uh, hopefully you'll take into consideration the scores of signs and comments that have been reported by the sign police in the last six months and not just what is said today. I didn't come up here to, uh, to reiterate all of that. It's certainly well known by everyone at the table on what the issues have been, continue to be. Signs being reported, reported a second time, and still they're there. Okay. Um, so at some point <laughs> we're probably going to end up with one of those lawsuits where we're going to uh, look for compliance from some business and they're going to turn around and look at, at what our history has been on the compliance part and uh, we're not going to be looking too good. Um, Paula O'Brien can't couldn't be here today. She emailed us. We got her we got her letter. Yes. And can I read that into the record today? Sure. Okay. I regret that I am unable to make the meeting today as I have a previous engagement with an out-of-town friend. I hope you rescind most of it, if not all the sign ordinance, as it currently stands. It's ridiculously crafted and not enforced for all parties. As one official has even said, enforcement is a problem as we have time constraints. Understood, but you can't enforce some and not others. The red zone areas, such as the marsh, should stay, but the Pleasant Hill Preserve should be excluded as there are no enforcement there, even after being reported. Although the red-white football signs were reported as illegal weeks ago, yet they still stand all over town. Hard to miss as we all drive down Route 1. Also reported months ago was the two illegal banners outside of, on Route 1 at the car wash and outside of Riley's, right across the street from Town Hall. 
Those were actually reported twice and also pointed out to the town manager, yet they're still there, and they were there this afternoon when I came in. Now, either they are being given a pass that others' businesses are not, or they don't care to follow the rules and regulations. I would suggest rescinding all that you are not planning to enforce, as it stands now, now too, all yard sale signs are illegal as well, and at times, at the times they are located in red zone areas. Who's going to enforce those on the weekend? No one. The political sign ordinance should match that of the state requirements. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Right. Anything else? Um, uh, can we discuss, oh, on this topic? Yes. You have something new. <laughs> Just the next item on the agenda. <laughs> which is identification of next agenda items, which is? Well, <laughs> um, so one of the things that has been kind of on the back burner, but we would like to bring forward maybe a little bit to the front burner, is we have a mass gathering ordinance, and mm -hmm. we have a public assembly ordinance. Yeah. and. Both of our public safety professionals would like us to kind of look at those and maybe think about merging them into one more efficient ordinance. It's always good to not have quite so many. Um, and also, one of the challenges that they see is we don't have any way to permit or regulate on-road races by foot or bicycle. Oh, and looking at what options we have. And so if this group is interested, I'd like to bring forward that discussion in July and get that started, if people are interested. If not, we can hold it. Would that include races that had started in other towns? I know we had an issue several months ago. It, oh. it would. Okay. Um, and looking, they're just, it's, um, it also would include looking at set facilities that are licensed for one activity, but that may wish to host a different activity that currently they need to come in and get a mass gathering permit for, and, mm -hmm. and what sort of, um, how can we create an ordinance that is first easier to understand and use and access, and that is also respectful of our businesses and, and their needs, while being respectful of the residents that are close by. So mm -hmm. I think, there, but the top priority for that I understood from the chiefs was, was really the on-road activity, that, that mm -hmm. that's the, primary focus for them about trying to find some way to address these ordinances, and then secondary to that would be um, just making it easier for our business community to, to host events <clears throat> on their properties. Do you remember that uh, incident last year where Pine Point traffic got backed up? Yes, yes. yes. Exactly. <coughs> yeah. was that, that, that was a triathlon, yeah. and that, that was the instigator for this. So we met very shortly <laughs> after that. Um, we had, uh, I think there were nine of us in the room, and just starting to think, okay, how do we address this moving forward? This is, there's going to not be fewer and fewer races, right? And so right. even if you have a race that's organized along the Eastern Trail, they need to cross Pine oh, Point right. Road. And so how are, we, how are we providing for that? And do we have any right to provide for that? That's part of this discussion is, does the town have the authority to say no to a group? You may not use our roadway for your organized activity. Mm -hmm. And we don't know that yet. We're starting we're just starting to look into that, but I don't want to use staff time to continue if there is an interest from council or specifically ordinance committee to, mm -hmm. to address that ordinance anytime soon. Well we I don't think we'd want a repeat of that incident. Mm -hmm. I mean there there was a lot of annoyance on the part of you think? Pine Point people who were mm -hmm. sitting in and, and I, I absolutely I was, think we have the, all over face we have the right to <laughs> control I mean it'd be like if you, want to, if you want to protest mm. and sit on the road for an hour, you, you, know, you can't do that. Right. So I don't have any right. doubts about the right to regulate. I don't have a problem with discussing no, it until I think I'm 19. Right, yeah. yeah let's okay. put it on right. the agenda. Anything and else? I've got one. Oh. Well, <laughs> and I think Marissa can give some thought to what sort of okay. information we would need. Yep. Yeah. We'll put together, um, certainly, the, just as normal, the packet will be available to you on the Friday prior to the June, July 19th right. meeting, and I will pull together with 
Jimmy's help. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, so Jimmy Puzzle is an intern from the Muskie School of Public oh, Service. Cool. He's a second year graduate student there. He also has a year of law school under his belt, so he oh, is very God. useful in many ways. And um, Don't scare him. Well, no, no, no. He, uh, he has an interest in a career in planning. And so oh, cool. even though he has a specific project that he's working on, the Town of Scarborough's internship pro program really is a project-based. Yeah. Um, in, as we're waiting for data to come in for his project, where he has an interest in planning, it seems like tying him into ordinance sure. would be a, a, a good choice. So um, you'll be seeing him again in July. Um, and so we'll pull together both um, state statutes that give us yes. permission to, to deal with those things, and then also some examples from other communities about how they are addressing the same sort of challenges mm -hmm. and, and kind of get to a consensus about what we want to do. Okay. Good. That'd be perfect. Or so did you have anything else? Then we'll go to well. That is the that's the one that's burning. Burning okay. for me. Yep. And well, then I would and we'll bring back. We'll have had the council meeting for signs. Yes. So we'll be able to bring that back to the meeting in July. Yep. And then um, our and then we should have a draft survey for your. Yep. We'll have circulated kind of a draft as part right. of that agenda packet. So we can discuss it. And then we'll be sure. able to discuss yep. it and and Get give it, it your okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. That sounds good. Well. So this, um, so I'd like to look at our in lieu fees um, in, in our ordinance. Um, yeah. Specifically, I, I, I feel like they <coughs> may be dated and um, uh, may need to be increased. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to also discuss it at the, or, or I hope to discuss it at the Scarborough Housing you Alliance. That. I was going to yeah. ask you. Um, do you know when you're going to do that? Next, next Wednesday. Okay. So I need to reach out to Marge, uh, the Sanctus, the chair of the yeah. committee, but. Uh, Okay, so you'll bring that to the July 19th meeting? Well, so what I'm hoping is that yeah. the Scarborough Housing Alliance will have a, an opinion of what they'd like us. Okay. To, what direction to, they would think it would be appropriate and, to go. And then it feels like the next step would and, be to come to this committee. And, and, do you want staff to prepare, like, do you want to get in touch with me after you've met with them? And if they do want to look at that, do you want me to pull examples from other communities to compare with? Or See, I think that would be that very would be, helpful. That would yeah, be that would be helpful. real helpful. Yeah. Because and, and there's, there's also a history of how we got it and the, Right. Tom has filled me in on to some extent the mail. And see, I think that in a memo, so that everyone on the town council would be familiar with how do we get to where we are? Yeah. Okay, so why history is, of, yeah. Why is Portland right. dramatically different? And they're looking to change theirs again. Are they? Oh, yeah. Hmm. But we talk about that later. But. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. At some point, yes. we're going to be looking at the signs. Can we look at also uh, penalties? Yeah. Dollar yeah. amounts in that as well? Yeah. That would be good. Mm. As part of the signs penalties. conversation? Um, yeah, there yeah. was the penalty reference. Yeah. That uh, was made. Being more defined. Right. That'd be worth yep. giving yeah. some thought to. Sure. Yep. Well, Anything it was else? described as perhaps perceived as onerous, I wasn't I wasn't convinced that making people pick up their signs, give them notice twenty four hours, then the next day, another day to pick up didn't sound terribly onerous. Mm. May also be a storage fee, it sounds like we have several yeah, here that we're gonna have quite a few in there. Or disposal <laughs> fee maybe. There should be something in place. Those wires are worth more now. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Other candidates. At a, at a <laughs> we'll have a swap shop. <laughs> right. If there's nothing else, right. we'll call to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Okay, thanks everybody. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Brian, for coming. Thank you, Brian.